Welcome to my podcast on How Not to Retire, A Psychological Approach to a Healthy and Wealthy Retirement, Episode 1, Unveiling the Historical Journey of Retirement and Its Psychological Implications. Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Richard Himmer. Retirement in the grand tapestry of human history is a relatively novel concept. It made its debut in casual conversations about the 1950s, back when the life expectancy of 62 coincided with the official retirement age of 65. Since then, financial planning firms have multiplied faster than rabbits in a carrot garden. What began as agents peddling insurance policies and stockbrokers taking buy-sell orders eventually involved into grand titles such as financial advisor, financial planner, fiduciaries, and so forth. The twist in this financial tale is that these experts have been globetrotting solely on the currency of money. In this podcast, we're breaking free from tradition of money talk and taking an intentional stroll through retirement, looking at it through the lenses of mental health emotional intelligence, and the simple fact that humans are hardwired to connect and to learn and to change. Until now, the retirement narrative has conveniently sidestepped the trio of connecting, growing, and learning. Retirement's often been painted as the Picasso of passivity, a masterpiece that unfortunately brings mental health challenges, physical hiccups, and a potential starring role in the drama of dementia dementia, Alzheimer's, or unexpected illnesses. The retirement industry seems to have majored in the how not to retire course. This industry seems to have entirely missed the most fundamental of human needs when designing these financial plans, or better said, retirement plans. They fail to actually build wealth and allow retirees to prosper. How not to retire is actually a template for avoiding the mistakes of the past and doing it right the first time. I invite you to join me as I unveil retirement in a new light, a light that not only slows down the aging process, but also beckons you to to free from your bubble of comfort, to free yourself from your bubble of comfort. Gary Brecka on the Joe Rogan Show said, Aging is the aggressive avoidance of discomfort. Consider how much time, energy, and money you spend on avoiding discomfort. While we address this in greater detail in later episodes, one of the primary challenges people have in forming and sustaining healthy relationships is our inability to face the pain necessary for change. As W. H. Auden said, we would rather be ruined than changed. Yet, One of our primary drives in life, hardwired into our psyche, is to learn, grow, and change. Ken Wilber said, Most of us are only willing to call 5 to 10% of our present information into question at any point, and that's on a good day. In other words, we lack open-mindedness. We lack the growth mindset, and we move to a fight-or-flight when confronted with information outside our immaculate perception. And this is where we'll be doing some vocabulary within the episodes. By definition, an immaculate perception is our belief bias based on experiential blindness. It's fueled and deepened by confirmation bias. It's marked by a prediction error, which means before we even have a cognitive thought, we're predicting which way it's going at a subcortical level. So it's marked by prediction error and illusionary beliefs. In other words, they're not true. It's what we don't know that we think is so that is harmful. So it, this immaculate perception is a space where personal assumptions are not questioned, which is an indicator of a very low self-awareness, which is a tenet of emotional intelligence. So in that definition alone, we've just hit a host of very deep-seated subjects that compromise our ability to live retirement and basically life in a state of happiness, joy, and well-being. 
So have you ever met someone who is more concerned about being right than discovering what is right? Well, who, who hasn't? You have probably see that person right now in your mind's eye. The closed mindset associated with low self-awareness creates a strong avoidance of this discomfort which causes the aging process mentioned. And therefore, by nature, it increases pain, suffering, compromises the immune system, and deep restorative sleep, not to mention how much it messes with relationships. So if you enjoy the world of psychology, emotional intelligence, neuroscience, and learning how you can find happiness, joy, and well-being now, you've probably found the right place. Retirement is not about snoozing through yesterday's glory. It's about living life like you're starring in your own blockbuster. Your peak self hasn't taken its bow yet. So prepare for the encore of a lifetime. In future episodes, I'll address why retirement is your bonus half of life and how not to approach it, complemented with researched strategies and techniques to maximize a full measure of happiness, joy, and well-being into your retirement experience. So for the past 20 years, as I've spoken to audiences across the nation at universities, podcasts, webinars, in every case, I'm usually speaking to a variety of folks from baby boomers to the alphabet soup generations. Therefore, any metaphor, joke, comparison, or story had to take into account age brackets. For example, imagine using the following concepts while telling your grandchildren stories of your childhood and youth, assuming you're a baby boomer to whom I'm speaking. Number one, rotary phones, record players and vinyl records, smoking sections on airplanes and restaurants, TV antennas and rabbit ears. And here's one that goes way back to my junior high days. Encyclopedias for research with 3 by 5 cards on which to take notes while using the Dewey Decimal System to find the right books. Film cameras and waiting for the film to be developed. And finally, dial-up internet. Let's chat a little bit now about the history of retirement. So the good old days of ancient civilizations. Did they have a retire plan? No. They just worked until their back gave out, and there was no such thing as chiropractic care back then. What you usually got was a friendly pat on the back from a fella toga-wearing colleague. No one updated their LinkedIn profiles back then with retired centurion or professional olive farmer in ancient Rome or Greece. In those days, you kept grinding until your toga unraveled, or you decided to take a permanent vacation to the Elysian fields. On average, people lived to be around 20 or 30 years old in ancient Rome. However, this average was significantly skewed by high rates of infant mortality. If individuals survived past childhood, they had a higher chance of reaching their 40s or maybe even 50s. Factors such as disease, malnutrition, and a lack of advanced medical knowledge contributed to the relatively short average lifespan. It's essential to note that these estimates are averages, and individual lifespans could vary widely. Factors like improved living conditions, access to better nutrition, and advancements in medicine have contributed to this significant increase in life expectancy over the centuries. Now, fast forward in time, but backwards in technology and medical knowledge, and we find ourselves in medieval times, where retirement actually had a holy twist. Leaving the workforce then meant you changed your three-piece suit in for a habit and a robe. Monks and nuns were the retirement enthusiasts. People traded in the hustle and bustle of the medieval marketplace for a quiet life of chanting and contemplation. Stock options were traded for vows of silence. Life expectancy during medieval times varied depending on the region, social class, and access to certain resources. Many people did not live beyond their 30s or 40s. Similar to ancient Greece and Rome, 
high infant mortality rates played a significant role in lowering the average lifespan. Those who reached adulthood had a better chance of living into their 50s or 60s, especially if they belonged to an upper social class or were members of certain religious communities. Which brings up the, co- the question, is retirement a biblical concept? In essence, no. The idea of contemporary retirement as conceived by 21st century Americans is relatively recent and it's not explicitly addressed in the Bible. Yet it's intriguing to note that the term retire, as it pertains to our understanding, does make an appearance in the Bible, but that depends on which Bible version you consult. The the closest reference I found is Numbers 8, 23-26. For context, the passage refers to males of the Levite tribe only. Now this is in the NIV Common English Bible. The Lord said to Moses, This applies to the Levites. Men 25 years old or more shall come to take part in the work at the tent of of meeting. But at the age of 50, they must retire from their regular service and work no longer. They may assist their brothers in performing their duties at the tent of meeting, but they themselves must not do the work. This, then, is how you are to assign the responsibilities of the Levites. And then in the American Standard Version, the King James Version, and the Catholic Public Domain Version, it goes, And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, This is that which belongeth unto the Levites. From twenty and five years old and upward, they shall go in to wait upon the service in the work of the tent of meeting. And from the age of fifty years, they shall cease waiting upon the work and shall serve no more but shall minister with their brethren in the tent of meeting to keep the charge and shall do no service. Thus shalt thou do unto the Levites touching their charges. So as we sip our lattes and ponder our 401ks, let's tip our hats to our ancient and medieval comrades who had no retirement age, no 401k, and probably no comfy ergonomic chairs. They were the true pioneers of Work until you drop philosophy. The concept of retirement, however, has evolved over time and has different historical roots in various cultures. Let's continue our overview of the history of retirement beginning in early modern Europe. The concept of pensions began to emerge in the early modern period, so some European countries, such as the Netherlands, offered pensions to soldiers. The first publicly funded pension is often attributed to the Prussian government in the 18th century. During the early modern period in Europe, which roughly spanned from the late 15th century to the late 18th century, life expectancy was significantly lower than it is in contemporary times. Many factors contributed to this, including high infant mortality rate, limited medical knowledge, and the prevalence of infectious diseases. On average, life expectancy at birth during this period was around 30 to 40 years. However, it's essential to note that this average is heavily influenced by the high rates of infant and child mortality. If individuals survived past childhood, their life expectancy would increase. It wasn't uncommon for people to live into their 50s and 60s, and those who actually reached old age oftentimes could surpass 70 or 80 years. However, factors such as region, social class, and access to resources also played a role in life expectancy during the early modern period. Wealthier individuals and those in urban centers generally had better access to health care and nutrition, which then could contribute to a longer lifespan. It's important to interpret these averages with consideration for the challenges and limitations of life during this historical period, including a lack of effective medical treatments, poor sanitation, and then the periodic outbreaks of diseases. So let's now move to the Industrial Revolution, 1760 to 1840. This revolution brought about significant changes to work patterns. As industrialization progressed, the idea of retirement started to gain traction. 
with the rise of factory work, there was this recognition that individuals might not physically be capable of working until old age. The Industrial Revolution, which began in the late 18th century and continued into the 19th century, brought about significant changes in our society, economy, living conditions. Life expectancy during this period saw improvements but challenges. At the start of the Industrial Revolution, so roughly 1760, life expectancy was relatively low, similar to the early modern period, averages as mentioned 30 to 40 years. The early phases of industrialization were characterized by poor working conditions, crowded urban areas, inadequate sanitation, and the spread of infectious diseases. In other words, the commonality or the common factors or patterns are the same. And this is what contributed to their high mortality rates, specifically among the working class. But as the Industrial Revolution progressed, Improvements in public health, sanitation, health care started to have a positive impact. Advances in medical knowledge, such as the discovery of vaccines and improvement in hygiene practices, helped combat the infectious diseases. The development of public health measures, such as the establishment of clean water supplies and sewage systems, also played a crucial role in improving or elongating life expectancy. By the end of the 19th century, life expectancy in industrialized nations began to show a gradual increase. While it still varied depending on factors such as social class, geographical location, and access to health care, the overall trend was toward longer life expectancies. In summary, life expectancy during the Industrial Revolution started low due to the challenging living conditions but it gradually improved over time with advancements in public health and medical knowledge. The late 19th and early 20th centuries saw the establishment of private pension plans by some companies, specifically in the United States. Companies like American Express and the Pennsylvania Railroad introduced pension plans for their employees. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, life expectancy showed a notable increase compared to earlier periods. This improvement was primarily due to advancements in public health, medical knowledge, and living conditions, as previously mentioned. However, it's important to note that life expectancy again varied by the exact same factors as before, social class, geography, and access to health care. Life expectancy during this time frame was around 40 to 50 years. This increase was due to a decline in infant mortality rates because of sanitation and a better understanding of disease prevention. The development of vaccines, medical treatments, and the establishment of public health measures played a, a significant role. By early 20th century, life expectancy again increased. In the United States, for example, it moved to about 49 years in 1900, and was about 59 years by 1930s. And this trend was also observed in other industrialized nations. It's crucial to recognize that while there was progress, significant disparities continued to exist. Social and economic factors such as access to education, healthcare, and socioeconomic status continued to influence life expectancy. Additionally, Rural areas often experienced different health outcomes compared to urban centers. The improvement in life expectancy during this period set the stage for further gains in the mid-20th century as health care and public health measures continued to advance. When did, then, the modern idea of retirement start? So we've been kind of going through this chronology, but let's now move to 1889 when the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck developed our modern concept of retirement. To stave off an uprising by young unemployed Marxists, he decided to pay citizens aged 70 and older to leave the workforce voluntarily. Now at the time, in Germany, life expectancy, well Bavaria, was 37.7 for males and 41.4 for females. Now, Bismarck 
kind of an outlier, retired at age 74. 20 years after his death, the retirement age in Germany was reduced from 70 to 65. And perhaps that played a role in this magic number for retirement in the United States. Now, this took place in about 1935 when President Roosevelt signed the Social Security Act, setting up a lifetime pension to the then, and remember this number, 7.8 million Americans over the age of 65. According to the popular pundits of the day, it was a, quote, practical solution designed to counter the economic effects of the Depression and to encourage aging Americans to leave the workforce and make room for younger people, close quote. At the time, 65 seemed like a reasonable age at which to encourage retirement. Well, the life expectancy in 35 was about 60 years old for men, 64 for women. What wasn't factored in was that by 2022, the average life expectancy in the United States would grow by 20 years. Today, 58 million Americans are 65 or older, and that number grows by 10,000 a day. Now compare that to 7.8 million Americans, and the life expectancy was 20 years less. The modern history of retirement is marked by significant changes in these societal attitudes, the economic structures, and, of course, government policies. Let me review a few of these for you. So the concept of retirement as a distinct life stage gained prominence about the 1950s, give or take. Prior to this time frame, most people worked until they were physically unable to. With the rise of the industrialization movement, labor unions began advocating for the idea of a fixed retirement age to open up job opportunities for younger workers. And I'm intrigued by the reason they did it. It was to open up opportunities for others. Post-World War II, there was a surge in economic prosperity in many Western countries. This period also saw the establishment and expansion of corporate pension plans. Retirement began to be viewed not only as a withdrawal from the workforce, but as a stage in life where individuals could enjoy leisure and pursue personal interest. The psychological mindset towards envisioning leisure as the coveted destination at the end of the work tunnel has become a prevalent goal. However, the financial vision materializes into a reality only for a minority of folks. While the emotional cost of not preparing for, for the final episode of life turns the anticipated dopamine hit of retirement into decades of discomfort and pain avoidance, hence aging. Without a quality of life, an extended quantity of life is akin to bondage. This marks a pivotal juncture in our narrative, prompting how not to retire to take center stage in, in my research. The notion of indulging in leisurely pursuits of personal interests works effectively only if we can accentuate the second part while balancing the first part. The real challenge lies in the leisure aspect as it contradicts fundamental human nature. Engaging in leisure becomes problematic when not balanced with growth, learning, and connections. This is the rejuvenation time. But when there is no rejuvenation because it's 100% leisure, you can see how that can complicate it because we're not designed to live that way. The hurdle emerges when a lack of identity and purpose converges with a detrimental mindset advocating for an easygoing approach for a significant portion of one's life. There is no historical precedent until the 1950s that leisure is part of a happy life. The extent to which leisure, leisure supersedes the pursuit of purpose correlates with mortality rates. In essence, the more leisure dominates, the higher the associated mortality rate becomes a dreaded statistic. Now, the next section is the 401k plan. In the late 20th century, 
there was a shift from traditional pension plans to defined contribution plans, such as the 401ks. This transferred the responsibility of retirement savings from employers to employees. The onus of planning and managing retirement funds increasingly fell on the individual. Remember at the beginning of the episode, I made this crack about financial planners proliferating, prolifer, oh goodness, about financial planners proliferating like rabbits in a carrot garden? Well, with the advent of the 401k, it's as if the U.S. government handed out industry-wide Viagra to the financial planning community, and we are now replete with so-called experts in retirement. However, their focus is singular, money at the expense of wealth. Now, I define these two words independent of each other, not synonymously as the financial industry is apt to do. Let me give you four definitions to set the context for future episodes and the, the remaining part of this one. Money. Money is a commodity, a means to an end. It is to be controlled and owned. It is not to control you. And when the predominant focus is on money accumulation, the primary purpose of money and retirement are missed. This is what not to do. Wealth. Wealth is having enough, is having sufficient. Enough time, enough energy, enough love, enough relationships, enough friends, and enough money. Money, or the proper relationship with money, can buy wealth. Wealth is a relationship you have with happiness, joy, and well-being. Poor. Poor is not having enough. You can have a bank account of millions and be completely poor when it comes to wealth. Effective retirement. Effective retirement is the ability to achieve sufficient wealth to maintain or exceed the quality of life that existed before retirement. And I propose, when you really understand the nuggets of where I'm going with this construct, it is to exceed the quality of life you had pre-retirement. So as I wrap up today's episode, here are five factors contributing to our current retirement situation as it pertains to the money side. Number one, increased life expectancy. Improvements in health care and living standards contributed to increased life expectancy. While longer lifespans are a positive outcome, they also presented challenges for retirees in terms of sustaining their financial resources throughout a more extended retirement period. Number two, changing work patterns. The nature of work began evol evolving with an increase in part-time, freelance, and gig economy jobs. Some individuals chose to work beyond traditional retirement age, either for financial reasons or to stay engaged and active. This shift challenges the traditional notion of a fixed retirement age. Number three, financial challenges and economic downturns. These downturns, economic downturns, such as the global financial crisis in 08, have a, su a substantial impact on retirement savings. Many individuals experience losses in their re investment portfolios, leading to an increased concern about financial security during retirement. The problem is many people went from a 401k to a 201k, and therefore applications to Walmart, McDonald's, or becoming a consultant in their field of expertise became commonplace. Number four, policy reforms. Governments and employers have periodically adjusted retirement policies and pension systems to address changing demographics, economic conditions, and social expectations. Reforms aim to ensure the sustainability of retirement systems and adapt to evolving needs. Consider pensions to 401ks, etc. And then finally, five, technology and remote work. Advances in technology and the rise of remote work have influenced how people approach retirement. Some individuals continue to work part-time or engage in remote work during the retirement years, thus blurring the lines between traditional retirement and continued professional engagement. Now, there's an ongoing debate about this retirement age. 
and what's right and what's not right. And I don't know if right or not right is the actual right thing to say because taking into considerations uh, the factors such as life expectancy, health, evolving nature of work, you know, some argue that there needs to be flexibility within this construct of retirement. And while I'm not going to s- suppose that anything I say will have an influence upon government officials, but the Social Security mindset of 62, 7, 65, or 70, 72 is what's creating the problems because we get stuck in a mindset that there has to be an age. So as I summarize, as mentioned at the beginning of today's episode, retirement is in the grand tapestry of human history relatively novel. Our goal is to break free from traditional financial planning and focus on retirement planning and how that looks. This is an intentional stroll through retirement, looking at it through the lenses of mental health, emotional intelligence, and the simple fact that humans are hardwired to connect, to learn, to grow, and to change. I believe that the retirement industry has completely missed the most fundamental of human needs when designing their plans. They fail to actually build wealth. How not to retire is a template for avoiding the mistakes of the past and doing it right the first time. So I invite you to join me in our next episode on our relationship with money and a proposed logical and emotional break from the Western tradition. So... A quote from the world of psychology, if I, if I can. When your awareness is raised, you see the invisible, you hear the unheard, and you understand the incomprehensible. If you do not see, hear, or understand what is there, they will control you. Until next time, may your habits harmonize with your purpose, leading to a life filled with happiness, joy, and well-being.